Jaina might reach within five five minutes or something. We start better. Good afternoon. It is my distinct honor to welcome you all to celebrate the launch of Constitutional Concerns, Writings on Law and Life. This book delves into the very heart of our societal fabric, a comprehensive exploration of democracy through the, through the lens of law. Authored by Mr. Kaliswaram Raj, a distinguished legal practitioner and scholar, this book represents the culmination of years, and tire, years of tireless dedication to pursuit of knowledge and advancement of legal discourse. Mr. Raj is a lawyer in the Supreme Court and practices in the areas of civil, criminal, and constitutional law. He was the lead counsel for the petitioner in Joseph Schein, the case that decriminalized adultery in India. He has previously authored two books, The Spirit of Law and Rethinking Judicial Reforms. He writes regularly on social legal issues in leading Indian newspapers and periodicals. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce and thematize your book, sir. The three themes that personally stood out to me while reading this book are democracy, resistance, and hope. Across the world, with the rise in populist regimes and authoritarian governance practices, we are witnessing the phenomenon of democratic backsliding. In simple terms, democratic backsliding is a process where democracy in a state erodes over a period of time and is fueled by the leaders or the executives' anti-democratic motives by using law, policy, ideology, etc. as instruments. This recession of democracy presents itself in multiple forms across the book. Part one is on, this book is divided into five parts and part one is on laws, part two is on the courts, part three is on freedom, part four is on politics, and part five is on life. Within this broad structure of intersecting themes, I would like to highlight some sub-themes that are recurring in this book. While this book is a social legal text of the recent events spanning from 2018 to 2021, it helps us to constantly navigate and converse with the legal and political history of India and also raises very important questions on the future of the world's largest democracy. In the given political climate and the events happening around us, the relevance of this book only increases. The chapters in this book take us through not only the recent debates around anti-CEA and farm laws, but illuminates us on concerns with draconian laws such as the AFSPA, the UAPA, sedition laws, etc. The book throws light on concepts of overcriminalization, or rather, a lack of principled criminalization with respect to various laws, including the one on triple talaq. In a country where free speech is throttled not only by the state, but in some instances by the court as well, for example, in the contempt of court cases, it is interesting to see how Mr. Raj draws nuances between the idea of free speech and the ideological problems associated with the idea of hate speech. Mr. Raj critiques the blurring lines between legal and political issues in the court and also addresses on the issues of mass movements, electoral processes, and governance. <laughs> I believe that writing this book in itself is an act of resistance, therefore. This book also compels us to think about concepts which we do not use in mainstream understanding of law, such as compassion, care, respect, vigilantism, vengeance, and violence. Each chapter is extremely impactful, informative, and succinctly written. I've always been told that brevity in writing is a virtue, and I still struggle with conveying my points in a precise manner. And one of the most commendable things about this book is the way it is written in such a short, impactful, and uh, interesting format that I could get through it with uh, a lot of ease, and I couldn't, I couldn't actually leave it till I finished the book. And especially coming from an academic background where we are uh, required to read um, academic pieces that span across more than 100 pages, I think this is a very refreshing change. Thank you, sir, for this. Um, and uh, on this note, I would like to conclude with a quote by Rebecca Solnit um, in her book, Hope in the Dark, where she says, Hope is not the belief that everything was, is, or will be fine. The evidence is all around us of tremendous suffering and tremendous destruction. The hope that I'm interested in is about the broad perspectives with specific possibilities, 
one that invite, ones that invite or demand that we act. In fact, Mr. Raj echoes this view and very eloquently writes, and I quote, the constitutional concerns that arose during the tough times are also dreams in disguise, dreams that we might share. Therefore, to me, this book is a beacon of hope, dreams, resistance, and a, persistence, and a persistent will to, will to act and make this world a better place. With this, I would like to introduce our panel of esteemed, um, of esteemed experts who will further illuminate the crucial themes explored in this book. Their invaluable contribution and ongoing dedication to the advancement of legal scholarship is truly commendable. Mr. Raju Ramchandran is a senior advocate and has practiced law for over 45 years. He served the role of additional solicitor general from the year 2002 to 2004. Mr. Ramchandran has notably served as counsel for the Justice Samant Committee, represented Kerala before the Kaveri Disputes Tribunal, and served as amicus curie for appeals of Ajmal Kasab and cases relating to the 2002 Gujarat rights before the Supreme Court. Welcome, sir. Mr. Sanjay Higde is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India. He was one of the two amicus curie appointed by the Supreme Court in the 2012 Delhi gang rape case. And, uh, He also represented individuals deemed foreigners under NRC and was appointed as an interlocutor by the Supreme Court during the Shaheen Bagh protests. He's a prolific legal writer as well with his work frequently featuring in top newspapers and publications across the country. Mr. Saurabh Kirpal is a senior advocate and has previously worked with United Nations. He has most prominently represented the petitioners in the landmark case of Navteet Singh Johar, along with a number of uh, other constitutional, commercial, and civil and criminal cases. A leading activist for the LGBTQ rights, Mr. Kripal sits on the board of the NAS Foundation. Ms. Jaina Kothari is a senior advocate before the Supreme Court and co-founder and executive director of the Center for Law and Policy Research. Ms. Kothari has argued a number of cases, including that of Joseph Shine, Independent Thought, and Navteet Singh Johar. She has practiced and written widely on subjects of constitutional law, disability rights, gender and sexuality, and discrimination law. She has also taught courses in a number of leading institutions, both in India and abroad. Mr. Bastian Shua is an assistant professor of political science at Ashoka University. Having, having gained his PhD from London School of Economics, his research is focused on political philosophy, discrimination, equality, and distributive justice. He has had his research published in a number of leading academic journals, journals and has written widely for several leading publications in India on areas such as reservations, religion, uh, religious freedom, and public policy. We are honored to have you all here and looking forward to an enlightening discussion. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I believe we should start with some opening remarks from uh, uh, each panelist. Uh, so, Mr. Raju, you want to begin for around five minutes? I thought we were going in reverse order of age, but <laughs> 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 I'm happy to start. First of all, let me compliment and express my admiration of my friend Kali Swaram Raj, whose writings I have been following over the years, I admire his clarity of thought, the conciseness of his expression, and I am most comfortable with his writings because I think um, ideologically we are fellow travelers. Uh, I don't want to compliment him too much because as a fellow traveler, then I'll be complimenting myself. But I think <laughs> he's a conscientious constitutionalist, a liberal thinker, a humanist, a thoroughly secular individual, someone who is deeply concerned with the constitutional future of our country 
and the deconstitutionalization, as he puts it, which we are seeing today. And uh, I admire the regularity of his writings also because I, as an occasional writer myself, I always envy those who can keep up writing at a regular pace because there's something called the pain of a writer to get down to writing, to put pen to paper or stylus to your device. It doesn't come easily to some like me, but I think Kaliswaram is a very, very natural writer. Now, <coughs> this collection of articles covers a wide range of subjects. There are a couple of aspects which I would like to touch upon, which have struck a, a deep chord within me. Kaliswaram uses um, introduces us to the concept of abusive judicial review. And this, we learn from Kaliswaram, that this term has been recently used in an article by two law professors in the UC Davis, University of California Davis Law Journal as recently as 2020. I've been struggling to some judgments of the Supreme Court. And then this term comes to us as something very apt. Now, what is abusive judicial review? This is where the courts, when their jurisdiction is invoked, they go farther than the executive and end up facilitating the executive in its unconstitutional actions. Now, one of the obvious cases, I don't think uh, Kalishwaram has dealt with it. He has given a couple of other instances. But the most obvious instance which comes to my mind, contemporary instance, not more than a year and a half or two years old, is the judgment in Tista Settleward's case. Now, Tista Settleward had filed, and I'm assuming that most of you are law students, so I don't have to oversimplify. Tista Settleward, who had taken up the cause of victims of the Gujarat riots, had filed what is called a protest petition in the magistrate's court against the clean chit given to various people by the special investigation team. Now, that protest petition was dismissed by the trial court. It went up to the high court and then lands up in the Supreme Court. And then the case ends with such strong strictures passed against Tista Settleward for having taken up the case and wonder of wonders, the judgment is delivered in the morning, in a particular morning in the summer vacation. The senior judge on the bench was to retire later, in late July after the reopening of the court. But having kept the judgment reserved for several months, felt it urgent enough to pronounce judgment in the vacation so the judgment is pronounced in the morning. It couldn't have been uploaded before 3.30 or 4 p.m. And the next morning, she is arrested at 7 o'clock in the morning or 7.30. And the FIR contains just copious quotations from the judgment. So the judgment of the Supreme Court is the basis of an FIR against an activist. So this is a classic example of abusive judicial review. And um, I hope 
this trend ends and we as lawyers as concerned lawyers have a duty to highlight all such instances so that the judiciary doesn't go beyond its assigned role and facilitate the executive in a matter like this the other two aspects which i wish to briefly talk about are kalishwaram's stress on language in court whether it's inappropriate sexist incomprehensible or verbose this is a characteristic of so many of the judgments of indian courts that i am glad that kali swaram has chosen to devote specific articles to this and then another article which struck me was his article which is entitled judiciary must adjudicate not mediate now uh my friend sanjay hegde and my spouse sadhana ramachandran were the two mediators appointed by the supreme court to go to shaheen bag so um as a spouse i was a little reluctant to tell her <laughs> not to get into it and after all the court had asked her and i couldn't have <laughs> even presumed to advise sanjay hegde but what was the result of that exercise or take this thoroughly inconce ill conceived ayodhya mediation a case which started in the district court in faizabad in 1948 reaches the supreme court in between in the 90s there was a presidential reference asking the supreme court to give its advisory opinion on whether a temple exi- a temple existed supreme court rightly refused to give its advisory opinion and when it finally came before the supreme court here comes this completely outlandish suggestion from one of the judges eagerly lapped up and who were the mediators there was just one trained mediator shri ram panchu and uh, though he is from chennai he grew up in bombay and he is quite conversant with hindi and so that was not the problem at all the other one one was a spiritual seer a god man sri 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 ravi shankar uh, sorry i said it many times because i didn't want to miss out the, the right number <laughs> and um, justice ibrahim kalifullah from tamil nadu perhaps they wanted to appoint all three mediators from among the south from the south of the vindhyas so that they wouldn't be influenced by local passions or prejudices but justice kalifullah didn't speak a word of hindi let alone hindustani or urdu so he was most ill suited and uh, attempts went on and one fine day someone moved an application saying this mediation is not going anywhere and the court decided yes it's not going anywhere and so we have no choice but to adjudicate something which they should have done in the first place so shaheen bag and ayodhya are two instances where i think kalishwaram is right in saying court should just adjudicate mediation is all right in inter party disputes which are susceptible of mediation 
but not in cases of national importance like this, not in cases which involve constitutional rights like the right to protest in Shaheen Bagh. And so while other panelists will talk about other aspects of the book, I congratulate my friend again for highlighting with clarity what is wrong in our judicial system, our polity at large. Thank you. You just aged me more than Sanjay and Jaina, <laughs> but that's all right. He, they just look young. They're better looking than me. Maybe that's the reason. I'll, I'll let this slight pass, not unnoticed. Uh, right. Uh, as I was just reading the book, and as Mr. Ramachandran has said, it's pithy, interesting, concise, even for a busy lawyer like they are. You can read, go through chapters pretty quickly, uh, and it doesn't. But the points that he makes, uh, and particularly the introduction, the one point that really struck me was his insistence really on a institutional reform rather than a individual-led or a public intellectual-led change that brought about. And that's the one thing that's, that struck me, because really when you talk about institutional reform, we have a constitution. Right? That's not changed for the last 75 years. What is it in it and what is in our institutions that makes a, that same very constitution function so differently over the last period of 75 years, if not the individuals who are womaning? Mm -hmm. But you please all buy the book and read who I'm talking about. Uh, and we've had a, a series of such uh, st you know, sterling uh, heads in the last few years. So I think somehow, Mr. Raj, there I will disagree with you. When you say that you have to reform and put systems in place, because I think systems are only as good as those people who are currently manning that system. Uh, the best laid plans can be re put awry if, if the wrong person is in the job. And that is the one takeaway I have from the book. The second takeaway I have is from what Mr. Ramachandran just uh, said, which is that there are multiple errors that happen in, in our courts. And one of them is lack of brevity. I don't intend to fall for that. Mm. And with that, I'll end my remarks. And I'd rather have an interesting discussion, and I'll pass it on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, oh, well, we you. applauded for one, so we can't now um, <laughs> apportion uh, applaud on seniority basis either. Uh, can I call on uh, Ms. Jaina Kotari um, for some opening remarks? Thank you. Uh, Saurabh, you are older than me, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think there's anything um, wrong in that. So yeah, just uh, responding, I um, know Mr. Kalishwaram really well. Uh, we've had the opportunity to interact and work um, in some capacity. Uh, so the book is a great collection of his writings um, and opinion pieces uh, that have already come out. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what I mean, just want to say a few things. Um, it's really quite remarkable that he has written on so many different current issues, um, you know, in the last few years, whether it is on the farmers' protests, I mean, uh, different uh, issues around constitutional law in the past few years, whether it's about the farmers' protests, the appointment of judges and the Judicial Commission, the role of the, you know, the Supreme Court, the arrests of human rights defenders under the UAPA, uh, corruption, you know, so there's a wide range of constitutional issues that have come up, really pressing urgent issues, and he has managed to write on such a wide uh, range of these issues. Um, so that's quite remarkable. And I, feel, and I feel that also as, you know, someone from the bar or really from the legal profession, to just be able to write and produce that is, is really the second thing, which is even more remarkable, you know, a lot of us have strong views and, uh, you know, ideas, but getting down to writing them and sharing those uh, writings is 
um, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort. And uh, I really want to uh, commend Mr. Kalishwaram to be able to do that with a really, uh, you know, hectic practice. Um, it's not easy, but it's a commitment uh, to constitutional values. It's a commitment to contribute to public, um, you know, uh, intellectual work. And so I really think that's really, really amazing and important. And I think, uh, you know, for someone, uh, for a lot of uh, younger people who, uh, at this book, I mean, you know, though it's a collection of uh, uh, his opinion pieces, uh, because it's collated together, I think someone who reads it would get a broad, a wonderful overview of what's been happening in India, uh, uh, you know, in the constitutional frame over the last three, four years. It really captures all the issues that have been coming up. So I think that's another way that the book can be like a great contribution. So uh, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's a great contribution. I have one comment, uh, if I can add. Um, you know, the book is titled Constitutional Concerns. And uh, two areas I feel you, sh you could have added. Maybe it will come in your second volume on gender and caste. And those are very, very core constitutional concerns. These are issues our constitution was based on. Um, and Mr. Kalishwaram has, I don't think he's any stranger to gender rights. He's uh, worked and he was the lead counsel in the adultery case uh, in Joseph Schein, uh, which kind of led to a whole uh, kind of new jurisprudence on gender stereotyping. So I don't think that is a concern. But maybe in your next volume, uh, we'll see more of that. So looking forward. Thank you. Um, can I now call on uh, Mr. Sanjay Hekde, who should be grateful to me for having been um, rejuvenated and youthened um, in this order of, of speakers. Um, so now can I please call on you? Well, as somebody said, age cannot wither me nor custom stale my infinite variety. <laughs> and uh, while paying, while congratulating Kalishwaram for this. Uh, series of his articles, articles which have come to be incorporated into this book and which, as Jaina said, provide an overview of what's been happening over the last three years, uh, over the period between 2018 and 2021. And I must pay tribute also to Kali, Mrs. Kalishwaram and his family for enduring him as a writer, <laughs> because um, as Raju said, it's very difficult for many of us to put our thoughts down. And when I know that when I sit down to write, my wife says, oh, you've got your writer face on. <laughs> and of course, Saurav is, um, has his own faces to make when he writes, and he's a much better writer uh, than at least me, uh, because uh, he sits down in a disciplined manner and he's produced at least two books so far. And a half. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, but okay. while we go on about the art and the industry of writing, what I'd also like to comment upon is that the relevance of this uh, is simply that there are those people who think uh, out there uh, somewhere near parliament who think that they own the constitution. There are people, the poorest of the poor, who say, yes, I have rights. They are the ones who really own the constitution. It was the tribals of Patalgari who put those stones saying that these are our rights. It was the girls in Udupi who said, no, you can't throw us out of uh, our uh, college uh, classroom. We have a constitutional right to wear the hijab. And uh, Raju referred to Shahin Bagh. And when I went there, when I and Sadna went there, it was a series of people who said that we are afraid that our citizenship is in danger. We have come to reclaim our citizenship and our right to have rights, our right over the Constitution. 
long ago, uh, I think uh, it was at the height of the World War, the Second World War, where Justice Learned Hand said that liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. And when it dies there, no court, no constitution can do much to save it. And it is when people take ownership of the constitution, <coughs> when people say that, yes, you are, you are here. We have given you our mandate. We have given you our mandate to rule this country in accordance with the constitution. But remember, you are here temporarily. You are here as guardians of the country and you hold the country in trust under the constitution so that we pass it on in a better fashion to the generations that will come after us. Uh, I am remind our neighbors across the border and us, we both had constituent assemblies to begin with. Our forefathers wrote a magnificent constitution in about two, two odd years. <coughs> Our neighbors never managed to write a constitution till they broke up as a country. And it was only in 73 that you had a constitution coming out there. And, but our neighbors had possibly tougher times which I don't want our, my country to see. Our neighbors had very great poets who came out of that uh, phase of building a new country, seeing it overtaken, and then trying to bring it back to the rule of law. And so there, were, there was this famous episode where uh, Habib Jalib, in the presence of General Yahya Khan, referred to him and his predecessor and said, oh, जो तुझसे पहले यहां तक नशीन था उसको भी अपने खुदा होने का उतना ही यकीन था दैट इज द मैन हु वाज सिटिंग बिफोर यू ही टू थॉट ही वाज गॉड एंड वन ऑफ हबीब जालिब्स फ्रेंड्स एट दैट टाइम सेड ये तो मौका नहीं था कहने का दिस वाज नॉट द ओकेजन टू से इट ही सेड मैं मौका परस्त तो नहीं हूं सो एंड ही वाज अ मैन हु कुड टेक ऑफ हिज कुर्ता एंड टेल यू that here is where uh, uh, Ayub Khan's uh, landed. Here is where Zia hit me. Here is where Yaya hit me. <coughs> but constitutions are often the product of countries that have endured struggle. And out of great uh, sacrifices come out with, a po with an operating system for the future. And I've often thought that the reason why we, in 1949, came out with our constitution, the way it was written, was simply this, that the preceding decade had seen extraordinary violence. We had seen the Jewish Holocaust. We had seen the Second World War. We had seen partition violence. We had seen the murder of the father of the nation. And that's when our, peop <coughs> our forefathers said, no, we better write it in a way that we don't go down that path again. And I'd like to end the way with what Mr. Kalishwaram points out, that constitutionalism can thrive only with the idea of egalitarianism. Viewed this way, we have not been able to constitutionalize our polity in the true and full sense of the word. This is an area where we failed as a nation. This, again, is the realization with which we can succeed as a nation. I do not want to see a constitutional failure. The task of realizing this constitution Wes upon the younger people out here who are listening to us. Because it is you who own the constitution. It is you who will be interpreting it long after we are, we, we are no more on the scene.
the constitution at each time has to be lived at each time has to be defended and we are all temporary tenants passing it on to a greater future that at least is our constitutional vision and i hope raju's writings saurav's writings but the writings of those who are consistent like kalishwaram will provide an important mirror thank you very much thank you um so i'll add my own reflections before we let the author um at his reflections and then we move into a a, a discussion uh, i feel that as an academic i won't do justice to the passion and eloquence with which um my co-panelists have made their case um i fear that i'm more the boring argument type person um but i do want to add something to the discussion um in in the following sense when i read through the book again um uh yesterday i realized that the title of the book perhaps is not quite accurate because the title of being about constitutional concerns doesn't quite reflect that actually at its heart the book is about democracy the book is in a large sense about concern not so much about the constitutional framework but more specifically about the democratic framework um in our country and then it got me thinking about the role that the term majoritarianism has and kind of concerns that i raised about majoritarianism and there's an interesting paradox right now um because after the caste census in bihar um had been released one of the headline news was that the so-called upper caste or so-called general category only makes about 15% of the population in bihar the rest of the population makes about 85% and that is about the same ratio as it is a ratio of religious groups in india it's about an 85 to 15% ratio and the prime minister leapt upon this fact so when demands were made to put the results of the caste census into action the prime minister was proclaiming that this is majoritarianism that this kind of 15% of the general category would now have to be threatened by demands um to be taken in the caste census and so i think we shouldn't necessarily dismiss this reply um but we should engage with it in a certain way and i think it leads us to think more deeply about the role of the term majoritarianism so in a certain way it seems to me that there is nothing intrinsically wrong with there being majorities or not um i recently read an article where martha sen pointed out that there are all sorts of majority in india there's a majority of cricket fans there's a majority of poor people in india there's a majority of um i think perhaps optimistically he put it um of people opposed to communal violence i hope that this is true um so there's all sorts of majorities and the question of which majorities and how majorities should rule is a sort of open question in the sense and so i think rather than using the term majoritarianism and i went back into the book except for one chapter the term majoritarianism um to my pleasant surprise played a fairly little role in the book we should rather be engaging with what are the substantive concerns about democracy that are being undermined so the problem isn't so much that majorities are ruling the problem is when the decisions of the majority undermine democrat democracy in certain forms and there the book offers as with plenty of examples of certainly concerns um if not worse there are some concerns about the liberty of the person but i think two concerns i want to highlight um uh, more specifically and one is the concerns following up from what jaina mentioned um which isn't yet in the book to sufficient extent but is there to some extent are questions about equality and and discrimination um they do feature in the discussion of triple talaq in the question of religious majoritarianism where the concern so much again is not the majority but rather the form of um uh, discrimination and second class citizenship that is sought and precisely this what um sanjay hector so eloquently uh, put out people are resisting in in shahin bagh and another part which takes up a scarily large part of the book are concerns related to the democratic process and related to the freedom of speech and this i don't think i need to remind anyone in the audience it's a particularly accurate con- um acute concern at the moment um and one which we should understand not just that freedom of speech is important for its own sake but freedom of speech is precisely important because it enables democracy and because it enables us to have some of the great advantages of democracy so when in his last comments sanjay mentioned um the concerns about the failure of constitutionalism and egalitarianism and the concerns about the poorest of the poor 
trying to hold on for their rights. It's precisely here where freedom of speech rights matter the most. It's precisely here where freedom of speech, the most remarkable his examples comes from actually colonial India in a form. During the Bengal famine, um, colonial censorship barred um, the reporting of the famine. And one editor in uh, the uh, Statesman, I believe, in, in Calcutta, um, a British man at that who was moved by the plight of the Bengalis just published photos of the dead on the newspaper and pushed the authoritarian colonial government into action to move against it. And it reminds me of one of the episodes that is not mentioned in the book, but that was quite remarkable of how um, Dainik Baska was similarly reporting um, and publishing photos of the corpses of people in the River Ganges during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's precisely in these bits that we defend freedom of speech, not because we want to just, oh, I think that's a very good reason to protect it too, but precisely because freedom of speech is one of the main things why democracy is valuable for those that are most oppressed, because they get to have a voice and they get to move politics in ways that works um, uh, uh, more towards, um, towards their interest and towards caring for them. o'clock flight given how long it took me to get here <laughs> i think i may have to leave early it's not because i don't want to participate i just apologize i once want to just congratulate mr raj again and i'm going to try to make my flight i apologize for this good evening everyone and I'm extremely happy and thankful for the good words spoken about the book. I'm also equally happy about the critical notes given during the small deliberation. In fact, this is not a book launch function. This book was actually relatively an old book in the sense that this was launched uh, one year ago in September 2022 uh, from Chennai, where my publisher, uh, Thuliga Books, Indira Chandrasekhar, was there. My editor was not there. My editor is now here. I thank her in her presence now, which I couldn't do during the book launch function. She is Basanda, and uh, she, is from, she is from Manipur. And this Manipur, of course, is uh, something which has added to the concern subsequently. So this is what precisely I wanted to tell. The one year after the publication of the book has in a way uh, shown uh, its relevance, but at the same time it has also shown its blatant inadequacy. So for the last two years, very many things which I didn't cover, which I couldn't touch in the book because of the chronological limitation, as things happened only subsequently, were rather more alarming, were more monstrous. And, and that added to the concerns, or rather the concerns were converted to constitutional shocks. This has happened, and this is something terrible. And I'm very unhappy about that. And as someone said, whether writing a book or whether the Constitution in itself is a sufficient device to, I mean, defend the Constitution. That question, in fact, haunts me very much. So many other things. We have a long kind of debate over, over the Uniform Civil Code, then on this one nation, one election, and very many things do not stand for a long time, but distractions happen. When you talk about some kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, appeasement of uh, persons at the helm of affairs, the uh, kind of capitalist, crony capitalist cap appeasement. You talk about one nation, one election, or you talk about uniform civil code, and you sometimes constitute a committee, as it has happened, as it has been said by uh, Ramendran sir, uh, with respect to Ayotthaya. This kind of distractions take place. Very often, I, in some art, some, one of my articles, I have attempted to describe it as a populist distraction or a distractive populism. That happens. 
and those things very often happens in the name of your in the area of uh, constitutional ethos and principles that is something which as lawyers uh, we should guard against then the we found this law commission uh, trying to revive sedition law even after supreme after the supreme court uh, taking a strong dissent in the form of an order again the sedition that we have seen then we have seen a judgment which erases the uh, age old principle which we borrowed from america against uh, the the concept of association by guilt that is erased by a three judge bench headed by a uh, headed by justice uh, uh, justice shah only justice shah then we have seen how the judicial appointments happen through uh, 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 mr damendran was arguing in court i texted him some message on the day when uh, uh, the uh, repetition against uh, elevation of victoria gauri in chennai was dismissed and things like that so and, uh, of course uh, the case of kerala story nothing could be essentially uh, done by the judiciary yeah, the film kerala story was telecast and it also made a lot of money out of it because of all the propaganda and all then instances of hate speech all these things have happened and uh, what i felt in a nutshell uh, of course mr hegde was uh, one of the um, mediators in shaheen bag but shaheen bag uh, has in another way taught me a different uh, kind of lesson i was thinking if it is a kind of religious fanaticism or or religious uh, um, Uh, attachment of the most prominent minorities uh, in the na- in the country then there would have been there should have been a larger kind of agitation protest or street uh, uh, protest during the time when the ayodhya judgment was delivered but that didn't happen the prominent minority uh, was more concerned when their citizenship was questioned by way of uh, nrc by way of or rather when that apprehension was there they were rather worried they were rather perplexed not even when there was the judicial demolition of the of the mosque uh, for the second time in history so that is something which one should take note of when especially when we have a lot of discourse on nationality patriotism and all this is again something uh, which uh, uh, we should uh, which 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 should strike us then uh, of course regarding the future of the constitution with that i will conclude uh, one study this is something which i told during the book launch function uh, during last year as well a study from chicago university said that uh, after uh, the year 1789 the average life span of the written constitutions were assessed as 17 17 years 17 years so the question however it seems that we take constitution as a textbook as a written compendium that it is more than that uh, we would have we will have to ask therefore whether we can fix an average life span for constitutional principles can there be a, a dignity having a life span like an idea of dignity idea of equality idea of liberty having a life span of 17 years or 20 years that is where we really understand the issue so now lot of things uh, come out someone describes it as colonial constitution someone um, uh, wants to plead for a different kind of constitution rewriting the constitution and certain things happen like that also you cannot have a one nation one uh, election without drastically altering the constitution we have to it is not a question of constitutional amendment it is a question of constitutional uh, alteration it is totally different one you cannot have it 
without changing the constitution. This is the situation where we talk about the future of the country's constitution. And I think in that area, we are all equally uh, uh, bothered. Just as uh, Mr. Hegde was to uh, describe, he is a perpetual optimist. He was to describe these times as interesting times, not as hard times or tough times. I don't know. I, I would like to have to share that optimism, but sometimes we are unable to do that. But nevertheless, it's uh, difficult times for us. What I would uh, think as uh, members of legal fraternity and youngsters, young lawyers, and as Mr. Uh, Hagde said, the, the law students, we have a kind of historical duty uh, to, to, to fix it in the proper uh, political frame and to be vigilant about things so that we can carry forward the, 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 of the concerns. The concerns uh, are probably the beginning of uh, the, the changes. We will have to think about it. We will have to share this. We will have to have a discourse on this and we will have to be part of this uh, larger deliberation. I thank you once uh, again and wish you all the best. Thank you. Let me um, start off the discussion with the um, following question, which I think summarizes some of the themes that, um, that the speakers have mentioned so far. So one of the themes was um, great level of concern and frustration um, about various constitutional developments. Um, so Mr. Raju mentioned um, examples in which the courts either do not decide, kind of what one could call evasive judicial review. So there is a either cases that perpetually get adjourned or cases that um, get sent to mediation rather than being adjudicated. Um, and alternatively, when the court acts, could be forms of destructive populism, um, as um, uh, Mr. Kalishoram mentioned, um, cases in which there are controversies that are being built out via, say, Suomoto cases or something of the kind, or cases of what, um, what Raju mentioned, um, abusive judicial review in which things are being affirmatively made worse by the court. And so this raises a question for those of us who want to believe that things can get better. How do we make things better and how can we make things better? And so in this case, I think, um, unfortunately, had to leave early, but Saurabh mentioned this interesting question of um, whether we should focus on institutional reforms. So what is it about the Constitution that made it possible that during the times of the emergency, um, there was such a decline in constitutional culture um, and one that is similarly lamented now, whereas in other times the Constitution seems to work well. So is there some flaw with the Constitution, or is it, as um, one of the speeches um, in, I believe, the Constituent Assembly, Ambedkar said that if the Constitution fails, it will not be because of the Constitution um, and the ways, and how do we see the way forward in terms of changing either one of these two things, if we want to be the optimist that, uh, that we're just urged to be and be vigilant about the future of the Constitution. So if anyone has any thoughts. Um, I would tend to that mere institutionalization is not going to solve the problem because it is the individuals who man the institution. Now, take for instance this collegium system which was touted at that time as a great institutionalization of the process of judicial appointments. Now experience has taught us what the collegium is. The barter, the give and take, the you scratch my back, the surrender to the executive conveniently. All this is happening in spite of institutionalization only because the individuals concerned haven't shown spine. And only today I was reading about a very interesting judgment of the Pakistan Supreme Court. Now there was an act of parliament to clip the wings of the chief justice to constitute benches. So there was an act of parliament providing that a committee of judges will determine the constitution of benches in a certain category of cases. 
only yesterday the pakistan supreme court without reasons are to follow later but i saw the pronouncement live also um the judgment is that no this act is valid that it's a measure of constitutional reform but instead of that one chief justice you have a committee of three or four or five senior judges all of whom are executive minded so what is the use of a collegium to create benches if the banning that institution are predisposed in a particular way or they lack the spine and so we come back to this institutions all very well but ultimately it's the human in the institution who counts but then i mean now uh, indian society often has two contradictory impulses that uh, we all talk about the family the institution but at the same point of time everybody wants to be uh, the head of the institution and uh, as a polish proverb says a fish rots from its head so often it is who is the person who heads the institution and does the system necessarily get the best and those that are chosen by the system will they endure long enough to remain the best will they be continue to be best or have they already gone by uh, on their sell by date by the time they ascend so we are uh, i do think that uh, as a people we are still getting together as a nation we are an ancient civilization no doubt but very few people realize that as a nation we are barely 70 years old and it is the constitution which gave us a blueprint about how we were to develop the ideas of liberty equality fraternity which came in from the french revolution and before that from thomas paine's rights of man which came in a marathi translation to phule and phule's writings against the inequalities of his time which transmitted their way down to ambedkar there hasn't been enough of a popular narrative about that we rarely see that even the tendency towards equality which we strive for is still a modern development it was ambedkar who said it is your very claim to equality that infuriates them if you are content to live with the status quo nothing uh, uh, they will they will be content to let you be so how is it that as a nation and beyond our classrooms beyond our unequal classrooms these days and you at ashoka you at Jin, jindal are now contributors also to an unequal discourse how is it that this discourse of unequals veers towards at least an attempt at equality i think that is the great task of this nation and sometimes i keep telling people that our ancestors probably had an easier task getting rid of the british that was a given india for indians was a given but what kind of india are we to build what kind of india are we to cherish as kanaya kumar very succinctly put it bharat mein azadi 
that is our task and that is the constitution's task joina you want to um, i think i would say that it's a bit of both both an institutional question and an individual question uh institutional because i think institutional uh, strengthening or institution building uh can to a la- can to some extent uh ensure that constitutional principles and you know broader principles can be sustained even if we have people who man it who may not uh uh think like that they can to some extent control against that um and you know let's take again the question of the court and the judiciary uh you know we know the issues with the collegium um and so we need a s- different system we need a different system that makes uh your appointments to our constitutional courts more transparent uh more merit based uh a way in which you have people across different minorities genders who get in so that justice dispensation can be uh more fair right uh, our current system does not allow for that at all our current system allows only for uh people uh, to get in who have years and you know generations of connection to the legal profession and to the judiciary uh people privileged by uh family influence caste religion all of that how are we going to have a diverse judiciary unless we have a system that is open and transparent whether it is a uh, njac version which is more equal the last version uh was not sustainable because of the manner in which uh you know the members were constituted but we certainly need a different system um which can therefore withstand some of the uh, vagaries of people who may man it um and and control that um so at the institutional level yes we um uh, we saw that to some extent when uh, uh new rules for senior designations were laid down right uh with the of course the judgment is being watered down but with uh the decision of the supreme court what has happened uh it may not work perfectly across the country but it has led to a great number of a different pool of councils being designated as senior councils for the first time you had some women we had it, you know otherwise for decades we had not a single woman being designated we've we've seen uh you know changes we've seen lawyers uh doing different kinds of practices who um were uh, uh designated so you know that brought about a change and that change was impactful and so i think the uh, uh the same should go to the courts as well and that's a sense of institutional reform a second sense is also about how do we build an an individual constitutional uh uh kind of value system um you know just in institutions not going to work how do we build a constitutional culture in our daily personal lives i mean we are all lawyers we are in the court we deal with it every day but do we deal with it in our lives uh do others can we in can we instill that at uh, the constitution like you know so many others said it's for everyone right and it's actually for the most uh vulnerable it's but where it is the particular strength how do we ensure that that is instilled you know i mean to just uh we may have all the other issues of you know surveillance privacy and all that is you know being dealt with in the book uh but today we we just had a case in in the karnataka high court that got closed last week it was a year long battle of a habeas corpus where uh, a young man uh had filed a habeas corpus petition um to get his wife who was kidnapped by uh, her parents she was an adult she had married against the wishes of her parents and she was under house arrest it took one year and finally she came back so we are talking about individuals not being ma- able to make their own life choices and those are constitutional choices how do we strengthen uh the resolve that we are able to do that and i think so i think it's both uh individual um, and at a personal level we we instill constitutional values and strengthen our institutions to protect them when we go to them 
Um, so I think it's a bit of both. Let me just add a few thoughts on both sides of the equation, um, as, as Jane and I was saying. I think on the individual side, one of the concerning parts is not so much the political rise of Hindu nationalism, but how much it's become socially acceptable in a certain way. Um, I think the BJP is an unusual party in the following way that normally right-wing parties across the world face two possible strategies. Either they moderate in a certain way, they try to find alliances and, um, and uh, team up with mainstream center-right parties, or they go into oblivion. They do very well in one or two elections, but then they disappear. The BJP is one of the very few examples, possibly Israel is the only other that I would know of, in which they have succeeded by just shifting the entire political spectrum to the right. The earlier BJP strategy of people like Vashpay or Advani was a strategy of building coalitions and finding partners, trying to moderate here and there. The current BJP does not do that. It has virtually, I mean, the NDA is, is largely just the BJP with a few smaller parties in the Northeast and half a Shevchena and half a NCP and probably now half a JDS. Um, so there is a sense in which this is quite concerning and similarly concerning is that um, social attitudes of Indians um, seem to not improve in this respect either. So you often have this idea that young Indians, and there was a lot of faith being put in the youth um, of India here. But if you look at what people say about questions of do you support the caste system? Would you oppose a match from a different caste? Would you oppose a match who's from a different religion? And so on and so forth. Young Indians are no more progressive than old Indians. So there is a scary sense in which, with one exception, and this is LGBT rights, um, there is very little change in, in Indian society across, across generations. So that's on, on the personal side where we have uh, a large task ahead of us. But on the other hand, there is a a line in, in Rousseau's social contract where he says that we should take men as they are and laws as they can be. Um, Rousseau writing men for both men and women, so we can just say taking people as they are and laws as they can be. And I think Rousseau's idea there is that there's only so much we can do to change the hearts and minds of people, and we should have institutional structures in place knowing how people are. Um, and there I think we need to think harder about what changes could be made. Um, and I think one bit that I want to highlight is in a lot of questions or discussions on constitutional questions, what gets a lot of um, emphasis and, and rightly so up, part three of the constitution, the fundamental rights, um, what gets fairly little attention is the way in which the constitution structures a political process. So for example, the Indian constitution has very few explicit protections for the opposition in parliament. Um, I grew up in Germany where there's a right of 25%, uh, I believe it's 25% of members of the German parliament um, petition it. They can have an investigatory committee which has quasi-judicial powers. They can subpoena government officials and make them testify under oath. So what could happen in Germany is if there was something like the Delhi riots, you would subpoena the whole minister and have him ask under oath, what did you know when when did you order which police to go where? And opposition politicians would have that constitutional right. Indian members of parliament do not. There is a lot of criticism about Indian members of parliament throwing ruckuses and shouting loudly, but I think it's largely because the rights that they have, the constitutional rights that they have, are fairly limited if they're in the opposition. There's very little that they can demand parliament would do, and there's a very large powers that are given to, say, the speaker of parliament, um, to determine agendas um, in the ways. So these are kind of examples, and I think for federalism, there are similar questions. Um, every now and then people talk about governors um, um, being a problem, uh, where I think we need to think harder about what those parts of the Constitution that regulate the political process could be improved um, to allow a more robust democratic culture in which um, various kinds of opinion and dissent is, is more easily expressed. Um, yeah. So this partly for me, Mr. Raju, you wanted to add something? No, I just wanted to add a frivolous note to this very, very serious discussion on institutionalization. Because uh, just two or three days back, the Supreme Court has institutionalized the institution of marriage. How an 89-year-old man wanting to divorce his 83-year-old wife 
they were not 89 and 83 when this divorce petition was filed but that is the story of the indian legal system um so the husband sought a divorce because if the wife hadn't accompanied him when he was posted outside the city and he says she didn't even come to see me when i was hospitalized with a heart attack various other grievances so he said cruelty now the case finally reaches the supreme court and uh, the lady says at this age i can't die with the stigma of a divorce and uh, so the supreme court ultimately denies divorce to the man so he dies in a loveless marriage and she dies stigma free that's the institution of marriage for us <laughs> maybe that's why uh, some divorce lawyers have a <laughs> saying that divorces are made in heaven <laughs> otherwise maybe um before we move on to um the question and answer period um one other theme that i want to uh, that i want to ask if someone wants to add um precisely the questions between the connection between constitutionalism and egalitarianism um, so it came out when uh, jaina was highlighting the importance of questions of gender and caste it came out when sanjay mentioned um that it is very often the the poorest and most oppressed um that are hoping for um for relief from the court or from relief from the constitution right in a important sense owners of the constitution um whereas the institutional uh forms in which these discourses are being being held is often as he nicely put it the discourse of unequals um so given that this loomed large as one of the themes i wanted to just hear from the panelist if someone um wants to elaborate on on this theme precisely uh, with regard to which aspect do you want i think that's up to you what you want to kind of add to this i think we have questions concerns about diversity in the judiciary mm -hmm. um but i think there are also questions of course about the larger constitutional culture and to which extent um um we agree or we might disagree with the assessment that um it has been a failure of the constitution um and perhaps what we can do to improve things and make constitutional culture more egalitarian in an important sense mind but uh what i feel is of course you raised it that maybe some aspects of equality are not uh, uh perhaps uh, very prominent in the book but if we raise the questions uh of egalitarianism or equality as uh the constitution kind of has its equality code i think that's an area that is underplayed in our uh in our public lives uh equality is a very core uh concept of our constitution our courts uh are all the time uh you know uh, writing or interpreting it uh, in our judgments but i think in our social and public and private lives equality is not as you said equality is not uh seen as a value to be protected uh in every way whatever you know um, aspect you see whether it's uh, faith or caste gender uh, you know economic status educational status political uh, choices or beliefs i mean equality uh, i mean you know we are the it's not a value that is instilled deeply in us and how do we do that i mean our constitution has to enable us to do that uh, and why are we not able to kind of instill that um and so maybe a little bit of uh, a lot of my personal work and interest is in that um uh, many other countries in addition to their constitutional uh in addition to a written constitution also have uh anti discrimination or equality laws the us for example has sex has a sex discrimination law race discrimination law uh, you know many other countries have civil equality laws 
in addition to equality guarantees in the Constitution, which, which, uh, pervade, which ensures that certain non-discrimination actions are mandated in our private lives, right? A, a landlord cannot deny a house rental to someone just because of the kind of food they eat or the kind of religion they are or their surname, right? Uh, it's not permitted, but we don't have any such legislations. Uh, and so why do we not have them? Why are we, are we not ready for, for an egalitarian, equality, non-discriminatory based uh, society? Are we not ready? And you know, I want to kind of question that. Uh, on the about his views on anti-caste discrimination laws which have now been passed in the US. Correct. How our society finds reflection right. there. Right. Mm. I think uh, uh, there is something common uh, among all these kind of uh, questions. Uh, one is the, we talk about egalitarianism, we talk about progressive legislations, we talk about uh, the kind of constitutional values. But ultimately, uh, I think uh, there's a close nexus between the uh, between the constitutional text and the kind of politics we are, we are experiencing. But Mark Rashnast has famously said that also. He says, uh, he asked the question, uh, that is the title of the book also, uh, why constitution matters? And he answers it. Constitution matters uh, 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 not because uh, it protects the fundamental rights, because even with the constitution, your fundamental rights may not get protected. Constitution matters because it gives shape um, to, the, to a politics which is capable of protecting the fundamental rights. So this kind of uh, importance of politics will have to be readily and necessarily understood in Indian context. When we talk about egalitarianism or even this individual institution dichotomy. I was thinking, uh, I texted to Mr. Ramachandran also after seeing his uh, interview in the Indian Express. I have read his book, uh, which has a very fascinating title, which uh, came out in the early 2000, isn't it? 2000, 2001, your book, the earlier book. Yeah, right. I was somewhere around here. I've been around for I have been around for here 16, for some time. 2016, recently. Uh, yes. <laughs> so in the book, uh, that among uh, several other things, he attacks, you know, this basic structure uh, doctrine, which was evolved in the famous Keshavan and the Bharati. So that, when we talk about basic structure, we also talk about a lot of institutions. It is inbuilt in that concept. You can't dilute, you can't uh, attenuate the idea of institutions in a constitutional democracy. But later on, when attacks came, he was critical of that uh, the, the concept which Keshavanda Bharati evoked so brilliantly. Ramchandran has had his own explanations, his own uh, reasons for attacking that judicial uh, principle, which is this, as, as far as German const constitution is concerned, certain things is akin to basic structure is inbuilt in the constitution called eternity clause. Certain things are eternal. But in the Indian constitution, we don't have it. Therefore, Mr. Ramachandran at that time was correct in criticizing the, with the, the notion of basic structure, which was in the, in the context, in our historical context, evolved by the court, not even by the constituent assembly, nor by the parliament. And this was the rationale of his critic. But now, when the so-called, subject to the reservations expressed by Basti, uh, when the so-called majoritarianism attacked this very same basic structure doctrine, Mr. Ramachandran himself had to qualify <laughs> his earlier criticism. So this happens. So my point is precisely this. Rather than the individual institution dichotomy, we often uh, confront ourselves with the context, the contingency of the propositions. Take, for example, uh, the collegium. Now, we all criticize collegium, all of us sitting here. 
were rather ardent critics of collegium system. But when criticism of the very same collegium system happens from an aggrandizing executive of the present day, then we think whether we were wrong altogether. We, may not, we might not be wrong. But the point is, as in the case of um, politics, you can't have eternal truth or eternal propositions when we deal with judicial you know, criticism or judicial evaluation. It also, as in politics, depends upon the context, the contingencies, the, the ground realities, the historical truth and all. So what I would su suggest is, in the Indian context, we will have to find out a language for the constitution to talk with the people. Constitution should have the language. Because we don't have that language of the constitution, we have the language of this Bidhuri in the parliament or someone else somewhere else. We have language. This, I think, is essentially a, 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 a lawman's function, it's a lawyer's function. This is the best check against the so-called hate speech. Someone wrote in a book uh, with the title Hate that it is not the censorship which is going to check the hate speech. It is more speech which is going to check his speech. Where we have a role, Kafka, uh, 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 in, the, in his book, uh, so Franz Kafka, in the trial, uh, was, has somewhere suggested that the group which is always you know, antagonistic, uh, or opposing to uh, judicial reform is advocates. And that was what Kafka said through one of his characters. Well, we have a difference. We think lawyers have made the constitution essentially. Of course, Ambedkar, you find Ambedkar talking about the law of limitation in the assembly, but at the same time giving a very patient hearing to an apparently, you know, Ill uh, cultivating during the deliberations in the constitution, which is missing. Which is missing not even in the street, not even in the schools, not even in the academic universities, but even in the parliament. The parliament, you know, the, the, the whole glory of the new building got demolished by a single speech by Mr. Beduri. Mm -hmm. We have seen that, we have heard that. So this is the political connected uh, with a kind of uh, uh, real politico of the nation. And this is my uh, humble view on the question of egalitarianism, on the question of individual institution dichotomy and all other que questions by and large uh, which are evoked here. Thank you. We started a little late, so I think we should now um, leave a bit of time for questions. Um, and if there are any questions from the audience. Oh, yes. And if you could briefly mention whom you're addressing your question to. Any of the... Yeah. So my question... Uh, Instead of like in you have recent you know just quoted something. No, you mean I contact with me. So questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now it's <is> precisely. <laughs> is constitution tolerant for any of the adversities? In a context, we have seen several instances where there is a deviation from the constitution. So do you see there is a constitutional tolerance coming in a way? Can you just explain this a little bit? There's one diverse judgment that has come. Yeah. That is precisely a deviation from whatever we have, you know, uh, listened to you. Like, you know, you mentioned about there is a right for the man yeah. to get the divorce. Yes, right. right okay. hmm. So in that no. context, hmm. so do you think that constitution has got tolerance yes. for such kind of deviations and all? Deviation, I... I was making a very frivolous point <laughs> about a man and a woman being locked in marriage in their 80s. I don't think this case should be an, treated as an instance of any kind of deviation or cons constitutional deviation. A man doesn't have a right to get a divorce. Correct. A man only has a right, a woman also has a right to sue for divorce. That's about all. Whether they get a divorce or not is ultimately for the court to decide on the facts of the case. 
Yeah. There are many other you know, instances where there are, you know, the rights are not protected. But still people try to defend for their rights. Yes. So how do we actually make it more resilient? Is it the institution who has to defend them or the individual by themselves defend themselves? So no, no, it is it? both. It is both. Sometimes the courts wrongly deny rights, <coughs> but sometimes the courts rightly deny what they see as not amounting to a right. So the courts are not always wrong, right? Yeah. The citizen is not always right. <laughs> mm. All right. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Ramachandran sir, sir, about that judgment, the, that Keshavnan Bharati judgment, as he said. Now, sir, judges, when they were in the bench, they were not critical about that judgment. After post-retirement, some judges have been critical about that judgment. And uh, we have recently seen that uh, even the Chief Justice had to say once, once in the, there was a view from a former judge. So he said that, no, he is not, now not amongst us. So this is not our view. It's not the view of the Supreme Court. This is what he said. And as rightly he said that uh, maybe your views also <laughs> change yes, about yes, it. Yes, of course. So if you could... Uh, we sir. all have a right to live and learn. So, so, we sir. all have a right to live and learn. <laughs> and and so if... Now, for instance, I recently did this case on political corruption. Right? Narasimha Rao's case, Supreme Court wanting to reconsider. So one of the judges who was party to the majority, which had said that an act of bribery would be immune, the judge, after many years, has said, I think <coughs> Supreme Court needs to reconsider its view. So I think that's part of intellectual honesty also. You do have a right to change your mind. You should be upfront and say, yes, I was wrong. Or what I thought was right then, I don't think is right now. I think we should have that freedom, whether as lawyers or as judges. Um, my name is Rachata. Uh, I have two questions to ask here. We've seen how Article 21 has been there in the Constitution for a very long time. And there's been a history of people, good people, on the benches trying to expand the meaning of procedure established by law. And Article 21 writes to include everything under the sun being expansive. In that sense, Article 21 was never considered to be a sacrosanct article. So when there were people who did not have so many good intentions who came on the bench and tried to touch that article, do we think in today's time that there was a bad precedent set for people to understand that, all right, I have the power to touch Article 21, which though falls under Part 3, should not have been touched ordinarily. But because there are precedents for expanding it, but probably I have the power to also limit it now. That's the first question that I have. The second one is particularly to Jaina, ma'am. Ma'am, today when we're talking about having more laws which would probably institutionalize the entire thing, what do we, what do we think about the root level? And my, my concern is because there is a very recent incident where a cop was seen shooting at the people who were identifiable as Muslims. So when we talk about framing laws, institutionalizing equality in the in the in the root of everyone possible how are we looking at these instances and how is it that we can or how is it that the laws that will be framed will change those mindsets that you know so far that you see a muslim you don't the immediate thought is not to shoot them in the face so these are the questions that i have i'll, I'll go with your second question see laws may not necessarily change people's mindsets. It may, they may, but laws may not change someone's mindsets, but laws will at least, if they're enforced, may change someone's behavior. You may or, you may, or may not believe uh, uh, in something, but you have to do it if the law, or you, you can't do certain things if the law prohibits you from not doing certain things, and if that law is enforced well. So today, even taking that example, do we, you know, like the whole uh, uh, kind of the George Floyd kind of protest that led, I don't know to what extent it's effective, but led to examining in the US 
police services, certain practices, right? Certain practices of violence, of holding down people, and how it was practiced against people of a certain race more predominantly. Today, in our police laws, do we even have any um, you know, provisions which say that if police officers um, act discriminatorily against certain people on certain grounds, can anything be done? We don't. In our uh, department inquiry, departmental inquiry may be there on that particular act of shooting fairly, unfairly, without provocation or whatever. But shooting or taking any step against someone colored by their faith, if faith is a ground, or in many other cases, it could be many other grounds. So we don't have a non-discrimination provision at all in our uh, in, in so many areas of both public and private life. Now, I'm, by having them, it's not necessarily that people are suddenly going to think very uh, wonderfully of different people, but at least publicly and in certain uh, public spaces, they cannot do certain things which are discriminatory. I mean, that's what a law can at least mandate to do. And hopefully, we, we hope that that will lead to some social change, at least in some way. Just to add to that, I think it was Martin Luther King <coughs> who said that the law may not make, me, uh, make you want to like me, but the law can certainly prevent you from lynching me. So that, th that is the limited extent that the, the, the expansion, the continual expansion of 21, also implied within it the right for courts to contract it. And uh, Saurav isn't here, but um, you know one of the expansions was in the LGBT area when uh, Justice Murlidhar and uh, Justice A.P. Shah decriminalized consensual uh, same-sex relations. And, uh, you know, the, when it came to the Supreme Court, we had uh, Justices Singhvi and Mukhopadhyay who said, no, 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 it's for the legislature to decide. We are, uh, again, looking at a further expansion or contraction in the next week when the uh, the, say, the same sex marriage judgment is due to come. But there, ultimately, what prevents uh, a contraction of uh, 21 or uh, 21 rights is that people then accept those rights as being part of their very right to be a human. Uh, just after Justice Singh, we passed that judgment and the universal horror. I had another senior judge, a very well respected former judge of the Supreme Court, who just couldn't understand the public outroar. He said, all that he achieved in 2G just went off. <laughs> in a so they, so they, were, they were, to a certain extent, out of touch. And I do think that uh, if there were more of them interacting, with the way the young think, they, then probably we, vo if we would have a uh, Supreme Court which is more in consonance with the times. If more Supreme Court judges were to interact with their own children, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one last question. Um, sorry to everyone else who couldn't, uh, couldn't ask a question, but I think we're already running quite a bit over time, so. Uh, my question is to Mr. Bastian. Uh, my doubt is whether the highest court in any country is greatly influenced by the dominant political culture of that country. Because what has happened in India in Ayodhya case is exactly what has happened in Turkey, Hagia Sophia. Yeah. And uh, mm. Roe versus Wade is now overruled. <coughs> Affirmative action is taken away by the US Supreme Court. And in Canada, we have been watching the uh, tweet by Prime Minister Trudeau. He has been. Uh, Supporting the six uh, protest against India uh, when they have demonstrated shooting at the uh, statue of former Prime Minister of India. Now he has come out with a tweet that we will not allow supporting uh, Hamas, mm. any protest. So the free speech also is having a different uh, yardstick when it is affecting uh, their own country. 
how does it work? Whether it is specific to India or foreign country sources, this is happening. Um, so I think there's a spectrum of, of countries and on the question of how far judgments of the highest court, however it may be called in the relevant country, tracks general political changes. But I think also the um, reasons and the pathways for it are quite different. So in the United States, for example, I don't think there is any direct interference with any judge in any form. It's just that the appointment process is so brazenly political that I suspect that in the next 10 years they will just, um, Republicans will start appointing a 30-year-old Federalist Society approved law graduate that hopefully has a good projection to live until 100 so that they can serve for 70 years on the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, there's a very specific sense, and in Roe versus Wade, it was a sort of deliberate strategy by um, appointing judges with this particular goal in mind. Um, and of course, Turkey is another country which, which has experienced democratic backsliding in, in various forms. Now, I think the question is still different in degree, and even in the United States, it's different in degree. The strategy by Republicans to appoint conservative judges that would overturn Roe v. Wade was resisted for various decades and was various Republican appointed deeply conservative justices like Justice Roberts who at various points rejected um, overturning Roe v. Wade in, in various forms. So it's, it's slower process in various ways than the sort of more tumultuous times that, uh, that we have seen, um, seen in India. So I think even though there are different shades of gray um, across different countries, and there are very few countries which have highly independent courts. So German Federal Constitutional Court, for example, works on a system that there are uh, senates of eight judges. They have to be appointed by a two-thirds majority. So there is an outspoken um, 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 arrangement that the center-left gets to appoint four judges, the center-right gets to appoint four judges. So you have the conservative party uh, agreeing to their candidate if they also appoint a radical feminist, which the Green Party wanted. And that was the deal they made. And these are ways how certain kinds of courts are a lot less political than, than other courts. So I think even if we admit that there are different shades of gray and it's part of a continuum, I think this shouldn't blind us to the fact that being on one side of the continuum is a lot worse than being on other sides of the continuum. One point which I wanted to uh, supplement, that in Germany, you know, this has a close connection with the kind of proportionate uh, representation in the electorate, which we don't have in the first past the poll system. So that may makes a lot of make a lot of difference even in the in in situations like judicial appointment, selection, all those uh, minor areas, you know, at the micro level. Plus, there's a connection to federalism. Some federalism, of them are appointed yes, by, sure, sure, by states, sure. so um, in this kind. Um, we're already a half an hour. Um, uh, wanted to ask just last question. Okay, I, I, I did say last open. question, but given that this is your book, <laughs> I'll allow you to overwrite me and, and allow one freedom. further question. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, and we all know that majoritarianism is bad, but but uh, does not democracy mean? Uh, I mean, envisage a system wherein the majority rules. So, uh, so supposing you take an example that, that the majority of the citizens of this country, I mean, which is actually ruled by democracy, mm. wants a monarchy. Uh, I mean, what is the wants a monarchical right. system, right. Uh, or a theoretical system, or a theor something like that. So in case the, uh, the democracy agrees to it, uh, it is against democracy. Uh, I mean, it, the democracy system will be, will be uprooted. Uh, but if you don't agree to it, you go against democracy. So how do you reconcile I this? Think, I think there I have a uh, very straightforward answer. Uh, Raghu is probably uh, confusing between conventional democracy and constitutional democracy. In conventional democracy, it is, the de it is the majority and majority alone that matters. Whereas in constitutional democracy, it is the courtesy of the majority to respect the minority that matters. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you talk about constitution, that is probably the theme of uh, our the whole discussion. We are concerned with those values which 
check the majoritarian onslaught and majority in itself does not uh, you know reflect democracy it is the constitutional democracy with which we are all and that is the significance of being in a constitutional democracy rather than in a conventional democracy okay so let me um, call this to a yeah uh, call this to a close there will be tea and snacks so um, people who have survived until now you will be <laughs> replenished um, and uh, so just to um, uh, to call this discussion to a close there will be a vote of thanks by Pranam um, Heotra from uh, CLPR so can I just ask you to Um, on behalf of the Center for Law and Policy Research, it gives me immense pleasure to propose this vote of thanks. Um, I think I reflect the sentiment of the room uh, when I say that this has been an extremely thought-provoking evening. Thought-provoking, yes, but I also think it's poignant and rare to be here at the ILI, to be across the road from the Supreme Court, to have very senior members of the bar reflect in this manner on constitutional concerns, but contemporary constitutional concerns. Um, and discussions there are many, uh, not least of all on Twitter, but to do so in a manner which is uh, reflective, nuanced, and traverses so uh, seamlessly between anecdotes, uh, constitutional principles, and international contexts is unique, and for this there are many to thank. Um, I extend uh, gratitude to senior advocates, Mr. Raju Ramachandran, Mr. Sanjay Hegre, Mr. Saurabh Kirpal, Ms. Jaina Kothari, thank you very much for taking out time from your very busy schedules and what I'm sure must have been a very long day in court. I also thank uh, Mr. Bastian Stover for uh, extending the indispensable social and political context without which the law almost always falls short and for also moderating and guiding the discussion. Finally, importantly, I thank uh, and congratulate, and I would like, I would invite the audience to join me in congratulating Mr. Kaliswaram Raj. <laughs> the reason that we're all here today. Um, today's discussion and the range of today's discussion, sir, is a testament to the breadth uh, of your book. Um, it was said that writing is an act of resistance in today's time, which is true, but I also think remembering uh, in the times we live in is an act of resistance and in the long history of the country it's important I think to document and this book will be a valuable resource towards that. Uh, I thank Tulika Books for extending patronage and support to work uh, like this which is very important. Um, and finally, uh, all of you, the audience, um, I think this is an audience of law students, journalists, uh, legal practitioners, uh, thank you very much for making time on a Friday evening and joining us. Um, as Bastin said, there is high tea um, afterwards where we can uh, hopefully carry on some of this discussion. Uh, there are also signed copies of the books, um, uh, of uh, Sir's book, but there are also other legal books that Tulika uh, does publish. And I'm told they're available at a 15% discount, which is a great offer. Uh, so I'd encourage you to... Um, uh, uh, have a look at that. It's in the front uh, in the lobby. The event today has been live streamed. Uh, Bar and Bench has facilitated that. So the event, the recording will be available online for those of you that, um, that do um, wish to have a look. Thank you once again and have a good evening. <laughs>